Okay. All right, a few seconds and uh, hopefully we're all good to go. Cool. Okay, we're live. All right, so good morning all hackathoners. Um, hope you've been able to um, meet your deadlines. And that is a deadline for uh, team formation, as well as the first mentor checkpoint at 10 o'clock. So I am so excited to present to you um, our uh, dear um, guest here, Patrick Couch. He is a business developer at IBM, an author, and has uh, roughly 25 years of experience um, inside information technology. And today he's gonna, talk, uh, he's gonna talk to us about how the AI, how artificial intelligence can save the planet. Um, what a title, I'm so excited. Uh, go ahead, Patrick. All right. So thanks for the thanks for the invite. Uh, it's always uh, great to get into these uh, type of activities. I'm a big fan of the hackathon as a as a method. So thank you for the invite. All right. So uh, yeah, how can AI help sa save the planet? There's a lot of talk about AI, of course. Uh, and so what I was thinking I'll do, I'll I'll, I'll set the scene a little bit. Uh, I'll set the big scene, a big, uh, the big picture, and then I'll zoom in given that big picture. And hopefully over the upcoming 30 minutes or so, I'll be able to inspire you and uh, give you some new perspectives uh, in regards to how to think about technology uh, and artificial intelligence specifically. Uh, my day job at IBM is to uh, help companies, big or small, large enterprises or startups uh, benefit from uh, IBM technology and services stack re relating to artificial intelligence. So if there are any specific questions, uh, please raise them uh, or write them down and we'll try and cover them um, at the end of the talk. Uh, all right, so enough of that. Um, there is certainly, let me see, this one's, oh, that does work. That doesn't okay, we'll do it like this. All right, so I hope you can see my screen okay. Right, so uh, humans have a specific and a peculiar and a long-standing relationship with technology. Uh, these are chimpanzees, and they are almost human. In fact, they share 98.3% uh, of the DNA with us. Uh, but... Uh, we have three times the brain size uh, of the chimpanzees. So although we are genetically in some regards quite similar, we are in all other regards quite different. And I think you could make the case for the reason why we no longer look like the apes, the hairy apes, uh, is like uh, Stanley Kubrick suggested uh, with Arthur C. Clarke in the movie 2000. 2007, 2001 is Space Odyssey, that the reason for this is our relationship with technology, basically. So once we strike that relationship with technology and we figure out, ah, okay, we can actually use that area, technology, to, to, to improve ourselves and to, to uh, become something other than the, the mere apes, then we are off. And like Terence McKenna said, one moment you're hunting ungulates on the plains of Africa, and the next moment you're hurling a gold terbium superconducting stellar device toward Alpha Centauri with all the mankind, mankind on board in virtual space being run as a simulation in circuitry. It's just first the one thing and then the other thing. And I think that is quite true. So today when we've landed the Curiosity rover on Mars and we're heading out with Elon in his uh, Tesla to outer space. I think it goes to show how very quickly we have become something different than the, than the other apes. And this is then I'm arguing along with uh, Stanley Kubrick because of our relationship with technology. And this progress 
in many ways have been a linear one for a long time. We've been humankind struck up relationship with technology and then just went into the future. And we've been doing so for quite some time. But now, of course, we are in a slightly uh, difficult situation because there seems to be a finite dimension to what we thought was an, an never ending open horizon. And so the idea of linearity has come into question. And there's now a lot of talk about circularity and finding ways of optimize use of finite resources. Now, what is different now, I think, than perhaps at other times in history is that most of us have now come to understand that there is no help to be gotten from the outside. There's nobody apart from us who's going to fix it for us. So La Linea, he can always sort of turn to his Italian creator and say, hey, you know, the line's broken, please extend it. But we can't do that. And I think the reason we can't do that is because we have come to realize that we are on this planet called Earth and we are pretty lonely. This is a picture that was taken in, in the beginning of 1990, I think. Uh, and it's, it's a shot taken of the Earth from 6 billion kilometers from the sun. And this is the Earth. So everything that we are familiar with is in, is in that pixel, basically. And around that, there's nothing. There's nothing. Right. And when Marshall McLuhan, the Canadian media professor, uh, thought about this in the 50s and 60s, he came up with this this little phrase that I've taken to heart where he goes, there are no passengers on spaceship Earth. We are all crew. So if you think of this, this is quite different from, say, the the idea of the future of humanity in the cartoon Wall E where humans don't really have a purpose whatsoever. They just lounge around and, I don't know, drink Coke and watch Netflix. But that is not the way uh, the world works, according to McLuhan then. And he also said that, aha, if you think about the planet alone in space like that, you could also see how the new electronic interdependence recreates the world in the image of a global village. Because basically what McLuhan understood very early was that as we build out the digital infrastructure that encapsulates the entire planet, both through fiber and radio, cellular towers and stuff, but also all the satellites. What we're doing is basically turning the entire planet into a single market. And the European Union has this notion of a single digital market for the, U for the European Union. And that is, of course, good in ways, I guess, but it's not ambitious enough. So if you think about the entire planet as a single market and a single spaceship, if you will, then I think it opens up very interesting avenues to explore in terms of collaborations and self-identification. So really then what we're saying is the, the blue marble notion of the planet is good in the sense that it establishes that notion of circularity and, and finite resources. And this is the one planet that, we're, that we know we have. There may be others if you ask Elon, but this is the one that we know that we have and we need to take care of it. So the question would center around, you know, how do we, how do we prosper uh, given the finite um, situation we're in? But really then what McLuhan is saying is, it's not really like that. It is more like this. Basically, the entire planet has become this digital single market, if you will. And that has implications for, for, for this hackathon. And it has implications for how we think about uh, the sustainable development goals, for instance. And another thing that happens when you rethink the world uh, as a digital global village is that the entire world is shown to be language. And Terence McKenna said, the world is made of language and therefore reality can be hacked. And he also said that if reality is made of language, then what we're saying is that it's code. And if it's code, then it is far more deeply open to manipulation than we ever dared dream. And I think this is an extremely uh, operationally uh, valuable uh, approach to our circumstance 
And I think that is also why it's so important with hackathons like this Open Hack, for instance. And IBM has a long history of trying to help hackathons succeed. And we're, we're, we're actively supporting that method and that approach. Uh, and we are, for instance, uh, supporting an initiative called Call for Code. It's a yearly hackathon. And often it's, it's a big, uh, similar to Open Hack today then, it's also targeting rather large challenges. We also supported uh, SkillBridge earlier on, uh, earlier this year, which is also another hackathon run out of Handelsskolan, uh, School, Stockholm School of Economics. And then, of course, what we're into now, right? The Open Hack Stockholm 2020. And I think what comes once you have this notion of the world as something that you can manipulate. And you can impact. And once you have a notion of it being a single planet, a single market, a single village, a single place, then you understand what McLuhan said about uh, what it means to live in a global village. Because he said, we live in a global village that we have made ourselves. It's a simultaneous happening. It doesn't necessarily mean harmony and peace and quiet, but it does mean huge involvement in everybody else's affairs. And I think today, with the pandemic, this has become, become extremely evident, right? The pandemic is, is not, uh, regardless of what Donald says, a national problem relating to China. It's not a Chinese virus, that's his nonsense. It's a global virus. It's in fact a virus that shows that we are in the same boat, all of us basically. And we cannot fix this uh, single-handedly. We cannot fix it ourselves. We need to work together with everybody else. So in this way, COVID-19 and the reason why it has surfaced as, as a suitable topic to address for different hackathons is because it is basically a grand challenge. It's a very big problem. And it's a problem that really needs to be solved immediately. Now, IBM has a long history of using the notion of a grand challenge to uh, steer resources into research and to try and see to what extent can we push the, the, the art of the possible and how, how much can we extend the envelope, basically. So IBM in the 60s posed themselves a grand challenge and said, can we actually land a man on the moon? Is that possible? And at that time, it, it, nobody knew if it was possible. I mean, some still argue today that it never happened and it is not possible. But for the rest of us, it, it turned out to be possible, but it turned out to be quite difficult. And we were working on that for, for a rather long time, but we did get it sorted. Another grand challenge that IBM is well known for is when we decided to try and see if we could teach a computer to play chess and play it really, really well. And in the middle of the 90s, uh, we were successful and Deep Blue did beat Kasparov. That was another grand challenge and it helped focus resources into a lot of the computational uh, technologies that were then relied on until there was this paradigm shift into uh, self-learning systems. Um, another challenge in the near term, well, near term was 10 years ago now, but was when IBM played uh, Jeopardy and we asked ourselves, can we teach a machine to play Jeopardy better than any human can. And the, and the test for that was when we played the Grand Masters of Jeopardy uh, in 2011, and we were successful and Watson actually did beat uh, uh, the Grand Masters. And that was at that point in time, 10 years ago, not a sure thing. We weren't sure if we could stand up natural language processing technology to the, to, to the um, to the level of, of uh, capability that it was going to perform at the level of these guys. Now, today we have things like um, GPT-3 and other things, and there's been a massive amount of uh, advancement in natural language understanding, uh, for sure. Uh, and so we come to the development goals. And these are, of course, also self-imposed grand challenges that, that humanity has post ourselves, we have decided that, okay, in order for us to have a sustainable future or a future at all, we need to make sure that we stabilize things. Uh, and therefore the UN came up with these development goals and basically they serve now as a grand challenge for us to mobilize around. 
and for the open hack 2020 here in Stockholm, you guys have your themes already in place uh, and they all sort of build towards uh, one of these goals. Uh, and I think the method is then very interesting because how do you work towards those development goals? I mean, these are grand challenges, they're lofty goals, they're super complex, they're large, they're messy, they contain very many smaller parts. And how do you sort of work with that? Well, one way of trying to reach those development goals is to leverage artificial intelligence. And there was a article published two years ago uh, by World Economic Forum in connection with their Davos meeting, uh, where, where they reported on a, on a, on a, um, on a research study that uh, World Economic Forum had published together with uh, PwC called um, Harnessing Artificial Intelligence for the Earth. And in that uh, research, in that report, uh, World Economic Forum and uh, PwC, together with Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment, map AI technologies onto these uh, development goals to see how they match and what can be brought forth to, uh, to, to build towards a successful uh, completion of those goals. So for instance, in that article or in that report, there are uh, six priority action areas uh, for addressing earth challenges. Uh, one is climate change, another is biodiversity, healthy oceans, water security, clean air. So these relate then to the development goals. And for each of these uh, action areas like climate change, the study maps uh, onto that goal or those sub areas, various AI applications that could be uh, brought in to sort of try and reach that goal. So if you think about the clean power, you think about you know renewable energy, you think about the smart grid optimization, uh, and, a lot, and a lot of decentralized peer-to-peer -peer systems where you may be sort of create local energy markets. So this is one way of thinking about, okay, how can artificial intelligence as a technology be brought to bear on a specific grand challenge? But artificial intelligence in itself is a rather broad area. Uh, it, it was last year, I think, uh, yes, uh, an article published in the Journal of Artificial General Intelligence called On Defining Artificial Intelligence, where Pei Wang spends almost 40 pages trying to define artificial intelligence. And then eventually he sort of comes up with his own notion. But when I'm out talking about artificial intelligence uh, for the purposes of, of you know, educating uh, people about the possibilities of the value of relying on or making use of artificial intelligence. I try to stay away from a lot of the nitpicking terminological uh, details of various disciplines within this larger label artificial intelligence. So I basically stick to a very simple definition of artificial intelligence and I define it as intelligence without biology because that gives me the broadest set of, of uh, capabilities. And it also makes it possible for me to think about the possibilities uh, in terms of capabilities that artificial intelligence could bring into, say, for instance, one of these uh, themes that you are addressing today. But then the shift really is on intelligence as such, regardless of whether it is uh, um, artificial or not artificial. And there are four things that I associate with intelligence and that I expect of applications or technologies or systems that are uh, viewed as artificially intelligent. One is I expect a level of understanding. I expect the, the technology to have some sensitivity towards context so that it is not merely rules based. So if you think of the calculator, the calculator is a non-contextual rule based intelligence, I guess. So it can add up two plus two to four every day of the week, regardless of whether it's raining or not, it's always the same. But a more complex challenge would be to think about uh, trying to understand something in relation to a context beyond you know, the mere rules and laws of, of uh, physics, for instance. Another dimension I would look for is an element of reasoning. And again, I think the 
calculator is great at identifying uh, a single truth. You know, two plus two is actually four all the time, forever. It doesn't matter, you know, nothing matters apart from that. But when it comes to more complex questions, we're not perhaps looking for a mere single truth. We may look at a more complex situation that needs to trade off uh, different approaches or different answers to a question to see which one is the better fit. And that is more intelligent than in my view. I also expect the applications of the systems to learn over time. Uh, if you don't learn over time, you're not intelligent, basically. Uh, and that means that you take into consideration your previous experiences. So over iterations, then I expect systems to improve. I don't expect them to de deteriorate over time and use, and then you have to sort of clear the registry or something. And then finally, a sign of intelligence is a uh, comfortable way of interacting. So when I interact with an application, a system over, over the use of design, I want it to be as easy for me to use as possible. I want it to be as similar to my way of thinking as it is possible to get it. So when I'm forced to suffer through the keyboard, my, my 10 digits become two and I'm not happy with that. I'm not very efficient. If I can use a voice interface, uh, completely different, right? And so the better the seamless interaction, the, the, more this, the more seamless the interaction between the application or the interface of the cognitive system and the user, the more intelligent it is, I would say. And this is of course, I think quite evident now in the proficiency of the natural language processing technologies coming and also the visual recognition stuff is improving. And that is a sign of you know, increased intelligence, if you will. Now, if you've understood those four general capabilities that, that sort of resides within intelligence, then, then you can think about, okay, what can actually artificial intelligence do? And I think, again, it is worthwhile reflecting upon this because it gives you a, a better way of seeing good fits between uh, problems and technologies that can perhaps uh, alleviate the problems. So it, artificial intelligence can really only do four things, but it can do a lot with those four things. One, artificial intelligence can optimize something. You can use various AI technologies to figure out how do you make something the best way? Not how, how do I make a more, more attractive product, but how do I make a product that I've decided to create? How do I make that in the most optimized way? What's the index? How can I do this with the least slack in the system? AI is pretty good at figuring that out. So think of constraints modeling. Um, also, artificial intelligence can automate things. So if you can figure out a way to mitigate risk in terms of uh, what happens if the AI screws up, then you can actually automate and you can say, okay, well, I will not be involved in the decision process. I will just have the AI do this. I will have the algorithms work it out between themselves. And we see this being played out, for instance, in, in the field of autonomous driving, where you don't have the time to you know, uh, ask the driver about the input and stuff like that. You need to be able to act automatically. AI can also be used to amplify or augment something, uh, a task, some kind of execution. And, uh, and finally then, it can be used to find patterns. Now with these four capabilities, artificial intelligence is basically able to do all the different things that we see and read and hear about in the news. But something that is very important to call out uh, and that is called out in that research that World Economic Forum and PwC did uh, is to make sure that whatever the thing is that artificial intelligence is asked to do, it needs to do so while at the same time being aligned with our values. And this whole value alignment is where AI is having some problems right now. So if you think about uh, the area then of autonomous driving, autonomous vehicles, we've already, have had, we've already had the first uh, death casualty uh, connected to autonomous vehicle a couple of years ago with, when Uber ran the Volvo car uh, over this woman. And that's a problem in terms of uh, not just, it's a tragedy that, that people die in traffic, but it's also a problem in terms of how does that align with the values of the car 
serve or the mobility provider providing mobility. Or think about uh, if you're Amazon and you want to, uh, they're going to recruit 100,000 people the upcoming month or so. I mean, it's crazy. Of course, they want to rely on some, some tech support for that hiring process. But how do you do that without risking the AI to misalign with your values? And of course, Apple faced the same problem uh, when they launched the Apple Card. And the Apple Card AI was scoring uh, men and women differently simply based on gender. And the problem there was that Apple couldn't initially explain why the results or the scoring uh, turned out the results it did. It was basically a black box. So when it comes to trying to make use of AI, you also need to make sure that you figure out a way to uh, have it align with, uh, uh, with your values. And there has been, I guess there's a little less talk about it now, but a couple of years ago, there was a lot of talk in the media about you know, the end of the world coming because of artificial intelligence. And, People like Stephen Hawking, Bill Gates, Elon Musk, they were all out there banging the fear drum. And I think it all sort of maybe started feeling like the age of AI was going to be the age of the black mirror realized and it didn't feel too good. And I think when, when, when you think about it like that and you think about, oh, but the, the AI is something else, is something other than us. It is humans and then machines, then I think you're, you're, you're simplifying things and you're misunderstanding that, that notion of our deep relationship with technology and what that means. But basically, I think, again, Marshall McLuhan can help us out here because in addition to what he has, sort of what I said earlier, he also said something very interesting that I think is very relevant for us here, uh, especially you guys involved in national uh, hack. And that is, he said, technology, media, culture, language, art, artificial intelligence, tools, they are all the same. They're no different. So language is a technology. Art is a sort of technology. And he said, what well, these are not, these are not ideas, feelings, intelligence, experience, imagination. So these are two separate domains for McLuhan. However, there is a relationship between the two where one gives the other. So in the world of Marshall McLuhan, the ideas and the feelings and the experience, everything that you sort of view as yourself is then extended into these other forms. And it is basically the extensions of man or the extensions of, of humankind that we see being played out in our technologies. So the artificial intelligence uh, that we are now trying to say will come and destroy the world for us is actually not something other than ourselves, but it is ourselves made manifest in an extension, in a cultural artifact or in an application or in, a, in an algorithm that is biased against women or whatever it is. And then we can see that technology is, of course, not good or bad in itself necessarily. So when now that Donald has turn Twitter into his, uh, his own personal you know, political uh, campaign tool, then we're not too happy with Twitter. But when Obama was doing the same uh, eight years ago, yeah, 12 years ago, we were super happy and we thought, oh, he is the social media president. We love him, fantastic. So what I'm saying is, I don't think it's fruitful to think about an antagonism or an opposition between AI and technology that will not save the world. What I'm saying is we need to think about it in terms of a partnership. And then we need to figure out, okay, what are we excelling at? What do we do well? And what do artificial intelligence do well? And once we figure that out, we can see, aha, you could actually use technology for your hackathons or your hacks in order to amplify, augment, or extend the execution of your idea that you've in innovated. So I'm thinking a good way of sort of tying this together in terms of how you can think about leveraging technology is to think about what Google did with uh, Lisa Doll. Now Lisa Doll here on the picture, he's a very good Go player. He plays Go very well. In fact, he's the best human player on the planet. And I don't know if you saw Google's uh, AlphaGo 
Netflix documentary, but it's a very interesting one. But what they were doing with AlphaGo was basically relying on something called reinforcement learning. And reinforcement learning is an interesting AI technique because it builds upon the notion of cumulative reward. So basically, in the, in the Wikimedia, <laughs> Wikipedia world of uh, reinforcement learning, you basically have an agent that takes an action in an environment, and then there is an interpreter rewarding uh, or not the agent based on the outcome. So in terms of the Go play game, then Go is the environment, AlphaGo, the algorithm that they wanted to play uh, Go is the agent. It takes actions on the Go table. And then the experts, uh, they evaluate whether or not uh, it was a good move. And then they iterate many, many times. And then eventually uh, you've taught the, uh, the system over this reinforcement learning iteration program uh, how to play Go. And that was quite successful. But what Google then did was that they said, well, let's do away with the crazy Koreans and say, you know, oh, let's just look at pure game. Like, what's, what are the rules? What's the objective? And let's not worry too much about the experience or the past, the fact that humans have been playing it for thousands of years, because maybe humans haven't played it in an optimized way. And then they said, let's have AlphaGo Zero coach itself. And then they iterated that for, I don't know, a couple of hours, four days, I forget. And then boom, they were very successful. And the funny thing there was the way AlphaGo Zero decided to play Go was at times quite different from the way humans play Go. But it was just a better way of doing it because it is more powerful. So when you think about the problem you need to solve, you want to figure out what the problem is. But you may want to have AI technology help you uh, innovate and execute around what are the ways to achieve that goal. Of course, in the best case, we are then Aladdin in sort of, you know, the Arabian Nights, and we can have AI to be the genie in the bottle for us, and we decide what it should do. But of course, in real world, and on fiction as well, it may not always be the case. So if you think about the Space Odyssey again, right, you have Dave being the agent, but really you have Hal, the supercomputer, the AI on the spaceship, being the one who evaluates whether Dave's actions are in line with the successful completion of the mission. And once the computer understands that actually Dave doesn't care about the mission, he cares about living and he wants to survive. So he's like, screw this. I'm not the, working towards the mission's completion. Then Hal just says, okay, can't let you back into the spaceship. Dave, I'm sorry. And that may be a fiction, but if you think then of self-driving car scenario, we need to figure out a way to make these self-assessing, self-evaluating, self-rewarding, self-enforcing uh, AI technologies to behave in a value-aligned way. And I think this is where Elon Musk comes in because he was, remember when he was on Joe Rogan the first time, not the second time, but the first time, and he was, he got shit because he was smoking dope and he was drinking whiskey and all of that stuff. But, and you know, he was playing around with the flamethrowers and it was all over the place. But it was also very, very, very interesting to hear him talk about why he is concerned about artificial intelligence. And basically what he said was, he said, it's a, it's a matter of control. We won't be able to control our technology. And I think that is very true. And I think that's where the focus needs to be. So when you think about uh, the, 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 the development goals or the themes that you have for the, for the hackathon today, you need not only to figure out what is it that you want to achieve and how do you want to achieve it, but how do you make sure that it is achieved in a way that is aligned with your values and, and that you can control it so you don't end up in problems. So in summary then, artificial intelligence, I think can help save the planet. It can help save us. It can you know, augment humans. We need to think about it slightly more uh, uh, deeper, I think, in order for us to see where the real pitfalls are. So this presentation in, a, in, a, in an elevator pitch summary, if you will, would be something like this. One, technology does make us human. Without technology, no humanness. Two, there are no passengers on spaceship Earth. We are, in fact, all crew. Nobody gets out alive. We're all in it together. 
Uh, the new electronic interdependence does recreate the world in the image of a global village. I think that thinking about the planet as a global village is very fruitful, especially if you're working with the SDGs. Uh, if you think about the world being made of language, you understand that you can manipulate it and you don't need to go like deep fake and all that stuff. You can just make sure that you take control of whatever it is that you want to create and put it out there. Just see it as an extension of yourself. I think you can view the development goals as grand challenges for us to team up around. I think AI can be leveraged to attain the goals as long as it can be aligned with our values. AI may not be easy to define, but it should at least entail understanding, reasoning, learning, and interaction. And basically, AI can do four things. It can optimize, automate, amplify, or augment, and recognize patterns. Technology is not in opposition to humans. It is, in fact, an extension of ourselves. And then finally, what I think we need uh, in order to achieve the development goals and what you need in order to uh, be successful with your hackathon is intelligence because ending on a final Terence McKenna note then intelligence is what we have to have to make the forward escape into hyperspace so thank you thank you so That's much it. thank you thank you what a nice presentation you know what really struck me the first uh and I, I don't know if you guys enjoyed it as much as I did because I'm a sucker for AI and artificial intelligence and, and you know, uh, generally tech, um, as well as stories about AI and so forth and so on. Um, but I like the fact that you had very little text. So we, we, we were forced to follow you through your voice, which made it so much more engaging is what I thought at least. Well, thank you. I think uh, now that we are running things virtually, getting that engagement is very uh, important. And it is also quite challenging. And if you put too much text, you, you pacify the viewer. Um, so you, you do. And also, I mean, questions are great. So it, normally you can sort of have a, you can have questions interspersed and just, you know, once they come, you just break and you take the question. And that makes for a dynamic, but uh, I think so far it's better to compile them at the end and have the interaction at the end. But you still want some kind of engagement during the presentation, of course. Awesome. Well, I got uh, I got two questions here for you. Shoot. All right. So, uh, yeah, I will as uh, as you would expect, um, and as you talked about, also this has to do with ethics. Yeah. Um, so this is a theme. Uh, so what are what about possible ethics? Uh, challenges, challenges uh, in ethics that we can face in the future uh, using AI. And I think you more or less um, did answer to, to that question. One of them was when you have AI, for example, uh, generating to you the best possible employee looking at recruits from the past and the recruits from the past happen to be um, not, uh, di not diverse and therefore the AI was as picky as any human that did the choices in the past. Um, yeah, to, to self-driving cars and what, what else is there? Yeah, so I think ethics has become a very uh, uh, discussed, much discussed topic. Uh, and I think since I'm a humanist educationally, uh, I'm very happy for, for humanities being brought into uh, the tech space because I think uh, it's not until recently we have technologies that are so similar to humans that they also come with the same type of ethical problems that we face ourselves. Uh, so I think when it comes to ethics, um, the, the challenges that we've been discussing and the Greeks have been discussing for 2000 years uh, are still there to discuss. Uh, and what has become important now is to understand that these same discussions are uh, needed to be had for technology as well. And not only simply because technology is becoming very human-like, but also because there's a question of scale. So if you have one biased recruiter going through CVs and that person is very eff efficient, it can just cover so many candidates, right? It can only screen so much. Eventually it has to go for lunch or go home. But an AI can, can screen thousands and thousands and thousands of candidates in a second and if it has the same poor bias or 
poor or incorrect view of what is a good fit for the, uh, the profile, then you will have a greater problem in terms of extension. So it will be not just one person being treated poorly, but like thousands of people being treated poorly. So I think that the, the stakes are getting higher when you talk about the automating and relying on algorithms for, for advanced uh, decision-making. Uh, but but with, with that said, I think there are also a lot of initiatives out there uh, where AI is being discussed. And the European Union, they have their own, Americans have their own, the industry has theirs. And then there are all these different uh, AI for good and good tech initiatives. And I think just having the conversation, just having it uh, out in the open, I think is important. But then also I think we do need technology support because what we need to do is we cannot have black boxes. We need to be able to, to some extent, predict how the algorithms are gonna work. And then when they don't, we need to be able to parse them and figure out why didn't they work the way we wanted them to be. So there needs to be transparency. There needs to be auditability, traceability in terms of the, the information manipulation um, functions that algorithms do. So, you, so, you, so, so you, we basically need the AI to help us govern the AI. And, and there, are, there are auto ML, auto AI, what's an open scale type solutions for that. So I think it's, it's a big challenging problem area for sure. Cool. Um, I, I've never uh, thought of myself, the AI uh, danger, so to speak, in, that, in exactly that regard. Uh, I guess most of us that are not so familiar with AI think about, let's say, self-driving cars that go wrong. And then we think, well, if one day self-driving cars will drop, let's say, the accident rates by a lot, wouldn't that be a question of ethics a lot? But that's also like, um, that's a really, really eye-opening way to see it. What if, like you said, uh, the AI is creating a thousand uh, candidates uh, per second or like per, per minute or... Uh, right, exactly. And I think when it comes to the self-driving cars, that's an interesting ethical uh, um, stew to, to stir. Because if you think about casualties in traffic, you basically have one and a half million people die in traffic uh, every year or something like that globally. And 90% of those deaths are caused by the human element, either in, in, in the car or uh, walking around in traffic or whatever it is. So if you could have AI cut death casualties by 90%, you would save you know, a million and 400,000 lives or something. And that would be fantastic on the bottom line, but you would also have AI kill off 100,000 people. And how do you, how do you grieve recovery for, from that? How do, you, how do you deal with the loss of a loved one that is killed by an AI? Who do you turn to for, for venting anger or fear or sorrow or grief? How do you, how do you make sure that you come out of that situation feeling, yeah, you know, it's good to have automated driving and algorithms kill people because they kill less. I mean, that's a very tough, that's a tough uh, message. It's tough to sell that to the market, that the bottom line is fine, but discrete values are not. Mm. Yeah, so we, I mean... need, we, we need to deal with it somehow. I have no answers, but, but I can see challenges for, for us when we automate things on on the on the on the grounds that it is good on the bottom line i think it's a diff it's a challenging uh, avenue to pursue that definitely hits home man when especially um hearing uh, for me hearing that um because um i come from greece where we have a lot of car accidents um mm. to the point i think that they actually um compare that to uh, a country being in war and we had more casualties than that country would have and um yeah, so if you ask me, I would say, well, that's definitely something that we should should be considering doing, at least in Greece. Um, yeah, and since since you mentioned also um, the ethics that they used to think about since since thousands of years ago, um, to probably two thousand years ago in Greece about that, um, it's also cool that um, that what you what the, the the words that you put there of what intelligence is and um, for example, how the arts and the technologies and, and language is not that different. I thought it was just cool that in, in the actual word technology in Greek, uh, technologia comes from the word techni, which is arts. Mm. Um, so, 
So that's um, I thought that was really cool and almost indistinguishable. Um, indistinguishable. Yeah, then, absolutely. No, you're right. You're right. We have one more question here. Hey, Tao. Here is my co-presenter, by the way. And the next question is, how much time do you think it will take to make a fully working AI? I guess here we're assuming a strong AI. Well, um, so, uh, okay. So, so what I'm thinking is that will never happen. It will never happen. And the reason why, why I say that is simply because, not because I think uh, technology won't be able to pull off the semblance, semblance of a fully fledged intelligent uh, uh, being, if you will, but I think it will be an empty house, if you will. So think about, uh, think about GPT-3. Uh, when it is really, really, really successful, and at times it is, I mean, at times it can do real impressive magic and you're like wow that's amazing uh, that just means uh, just fill me in please gpt3 no oh, gpt3 sorry uh, open ai uh, uh, a consortium created this enormous language model called uh, gpt3 it's the third version of that language model it's called the uh, uh, generative pre-trained i forget the, what it stands for but basically what it is it's it's a vastly complex and capable language model that can basically appear human-like in its way of using language. So you can ask it things and it will, it will answer very impressively. You can have it uh, write articles about different topics and it will write pretty good pieces. You can, ask, you can ask it to sort of, you can write in a few words and then ask it to sort of, what are the next words that should come? And, and so when you interact with that language model, it sort of feels like you're almost interacting with a human being. You can't really tell them apart at times. But anyway, regardless, when that happens and it is the most successful, that is just saying that the lights are on, but it doesn't necessarily mean that anybody's home. And so when you think about that, the Turing test, Turing, Alan Turing in the 50s, when he wrote that piece on, on thinking machines, he put that test right. If you can't tell whether or not you're interacting with a person or a computer, then the computer is a thinking computer. So, so, so and of course, in, uh, in the movie Blade Runner, you have, uh, you have Harrison Ford running around trying to figure out who's the Blade Runner and who's, who's regular people and by asking these psychological tests and eventually the, the cyborgs would go like a conk and he would just kill them off. But I think, and we have the, we have the, the CAPTCHA tests, like when, when, the, when the machines, they ask us if we are a machine or a person and we go, I am not a robot. I can spot, spot all, the, all the mailboxes or the crossings and all that stuff, right? But anyway, I think there will be a point in time where we may not be able to tell the difference between the deep fakes, if you will, the bots and, the, and our, our friends online. I think that will happen eventually, but I don't think that will be the same as a general intelligence or a strong intelligence with all, with all that, that entails. I think it's, uh, it will be, um, a ghost. That's what I think. All right. I guess it's uh, what's left is just to, to see, and hopefully we'll live long enough for, for yeah, us to see some great advances in AI. Yeah, and also I think uh, there may be there may be um, advances in in uh, um, neuroscience and, and physiology and biology that will that will give us more insights into the the normal brain and how that works actually, because today nobody knows how consciousness works. There's nobody, nobody's gonna put their cock on the block and say, yeah, I, I'll define consciousness for you. This is the way it is, because you can't. And therefore to ask the question, okay, but when will technology be on par with consciousness? You know, that's, that's, a, that's a difficult question to answer. But, right. it, but it is very interesting for sure. And there are a lot of breakthroughs all the time, both in terms of neuroscience and how the brain actually works, but also what technology can do. Needless to say, I can do this all day. Um, well, um, thank you so much, Patrick, uh, for, for doing this. It was really grateful to have you on. So um, thank you. I'm Patrick Couch, everybody, business developer at IBM, as well as author. And this was his talk, uh, how artificial intelligence can, ha uh, can, can help save the planet. 
Thank you so much, Patrick. Thank you. Good luck with the hackathon. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.